working, which I've been enjoying a lot so far. Um, I think that uh, most of the talks in the tutorial yesterday and also today, maybe with the exception of Sean's, were on using uh, some new and interesting uh, tools to solve some very old and difficult problems. And uh, today I'd like to try to talk about what I think is a, maybe a little bit of a new problem so I can use some old tools to try to understand something about it. And this uh, new problem is something which, for lack of a better name, I'm going to call a quantum ferroelectric metal. And I'll explain in a moment what I mean by quantum ferroelectric metal. It's something I've been thinking about with my collaborators here, uh, Rafael Fernandez, Vlad Kozi, and uh, Jonathan uh, Ruchman for the last uh, maybe couple of years. And if I have time, I'm going to try to show some, uh, I think, very interesting experiments in the group of uh, Martin Greven from the time when I was a postdoc at Minnesota. So what do I mean when I say quantum ferroelectric metal? <clears throat> so really what I mean is a quantum ferroelectric metal. It should be a material which is metallic and is also polar in the sense that it has broken inversion symmetry and should in some sense have dipole moments. And at the same time, it should have some kind of strong electronic correlations in some sense. And this actually for many years was thought to be an impossibility to the point where if someone said ferroelectric metal in a seminar, he got yelled at. But in recent years, uh, people have discovered a real zoo of materials that have these properties. They're typically doped uh, semi-metals or semiconductors. Uh, here are two kind of prototypical examples, strontium titanate. It's a quantum power electric, meaning it's a material that at low temperatures almost becomes ferroelectric when it's insulating. And then you can play with it a bit and make it ferroelectric or uh, molydactyloride, which is a TMD, which has also broken inversion symmetry. And uh, typically you can take these materials and dope them a little bit to make them uh, conducting. And uh, they're very easy to dope. They're very easy to strain. They're very easy to photo control, which makes them a very useful applica for applications in quantum materials. And they have a huge number of fascinating properties, both from basic science and applications point of view. They typically host dipole moments, have the, they have strong spin orbit coupling. Almost, I think maybe all of them have superconductivity at low temperatures. And there are increasingly more and more signs of unconventional superconductivity in many of these materials. In terms of band structures, you can find parabolic, topological, non-topological, Dirac and Vial band structures in various of these compounds. And really all of this kind of goodness is a result of the fact that they have broken inversion symmetry. And of course, people have been studying metals with broken inversion symmetry already for quite some time in the context of you know, non-central symmetric superconductors, topological superconductivity, and so forth. But the problem that, uh, that uh, we've been thinking about is the following one. At the end of the day, this process of inversion breaking is a dynamical process. And what I mean is, in many of these materials, you can take them, like these two, and through some tuning parameter, doping or pressure, you can tune them in and out of the inversion broken state. And that means that you go through a quantum critical point, and so you're being driven somehow by dynamical fluctuations that break inversion symmetry, that's something which usually comes with electric fields, which doesn't make sense in the contents of a metal. And so you really need to ask yourself, what are these dynamical processes that break inversion in a metal? And how do they affect the fermions in the system? And can we use them for something useful? So that is the, the problem that I'm going to try to address in this talk and maybe convince you that it's an interesting problem to think about. What? Without doping, some yes, some no. So the like I said, the typically semi-metals and semiconductors, but of course, typical isn't necessarily what's in the lab. That's what's in DFT. So you'll often find that they are metallic and they're as grown state. Okay. But say strontium titanate, which is I think the only one of these materials that has been extensively studied. There's really not enough experiment on these materials. Uh, that one is an insulating in its parent state, and it can be doped to very very light doping. We'll talk about it. So really what we want to do is kind of construct an effective low energy theory for such a problem. And the idea should be as follows. Take your, your favorite uh, version of an unconventional superconductor, iron-based, cuprate, uh, uranium-based. And, and we have this, I think, at least partial consensus in the community that at least qualitatively, you can get an idea of what should go on in these materials by thinking of a quantum critical point between an ordered and disordered state. Then you have quantum critical fluctuations that somehow dominate the phase diagram. 
And hopefully they also give rise to the superconducting dome that appears at the bottom. And I would like to try to construct a theory for the case of a material which breaks inversion symmetry. Can I do a similar kind of effective theory uh, um, for these materials? So typical questions I might ask is, is this a Fermi liquid or a non-Fermi liquid? What are the low temperature phases? How does pairing occur in the system, if at all? And uh, can I control it by external parameters? This would be, I think, extremely important in the context of quantum materials. <clears throat> it's also how we get paid because our grant is on quantum devices and materials. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'll start with an introduction to introduce what exactly or what may be our ferroelectrics and ferroelectric metals and how we should think of the problem. Then I'll go into a good deal of detail on what happens with a Fermi liquid that's a quantum ferroelectric metal. This should, it's not published yet, it should appear on the archive in the next day or two. Then I will uh, try to show you this intriguing experiment to convince you that not everything I'm saying is theory la la land. And then if I have time, which I definitely won't, I'll try to talk a little bit about the case of the Dirac point. I'm, I really just put it here so I can tell you that it's interesting and the superconductivity of the charge neutrality point, but there's no way I'll get to it. So let's go into the introduction instead. Um, so in order to explain uh, about a quantum ferroelectric metal, I really need to start by talking about what creates an insulating ferroelectric. And typically, if a material is, insula is a ferroelectric at low temperatures, it works through the condensation, typically, not always, of a soft phonon, what's called the displacive transition. And a toy a cartoon to think of it would be to think of an ionic lattice. So you have ionic forces, and then you have dipole forces between them, and you have some soft polar mode, which eventually condenses and deforms your lattice. This creates a finite polarization in the system and a macroscopic electric field running through your system. And uh, uh, for many years, it was believed, and it's very often correct, that this is a result of long range Coulomb forces, essentially van der Waals forces between your lattice or inter, inter unit cell uh, ionic forces. And this is what causes the instability to formation of dipole moments. And uh, as a result, it turns out that the optical mode that condenses must be transverse. You can actually see that in this figure here. This is showing the polar optical mode in strontium titanate which as you see has a longitudinal component that remains hard down to low temperatures. This is in, I believe in inverse centimeters and a transverse mode which dives down in frequency and becomes soft as you lower temperature. Actually in strontium titanate, it never hits zero but you put a little bit of strain and it hits zero and the system becomes a ferroelectric. This is uh, well known under the name of the ledain sachs teller relation which tell you, tells you that Coulomb forces renormalize the longitudinal mode and force it to remain hard. So only the transverse mode becomes soft and goes critical. And this immediately causes trouble when you go to a metal. Because in the first place, if you have a conducting system, then you have a Fermi surface. And so long range Coulomb is screened. So you shouldn't even have a ferroelectric transition in such a system, it should be screened out. But even assuming that somehow I construct a material which does undergo such a transition at low temperature, there's the question of how to couple to electrons. The usual coupling to electrons is through electrostatic forces. Those go as the divergence of your phonon, say U. So they go as Q dot the polarization, but this is a transverse phonon. So in the low temperature, long wavelength limit, Q dot P just goes to zero. So even if you did have such a material, you would really have two independent subsystems, an insulating subsystem that goes ferroelectric and a conducting system that knows nothing about the ferroelectric system. But in practice, it's clear that the systems are coupled because in all these materials, you find the superconductivity. It's very often somehow correlated with the quantum critical point of the polar phonon. There's a good deal of indirect evidence. And also there's a lot of other evidence which I'm not showing here of anomalous electronic properties. Some of those actually Mitya Maslow showed yesterday, strontium titanate has extremely strange uh, um, uh, transport properties uh, and so forth. <clears throat> So the first step is actually, can we even construct an interaction? We need some way to couple the, uh, the two systems together, my electrons and my phonons. And this is what you want to think of. You have an insulator and you dope it with electrons. And now you want to see how they speak to one another. So what would be the properties of such a coupling? So you're going to need a transverse optical phonon and you're going to need itinerant fermions. And one thing to note is that you can have these you can have your system deform 
but you don't need to have an electric field. You can just have some high energy conduction electrons screen out your polarization in the material. But as an order parameter, your phonon, which breaks inversion symmetry, is still a good object. So you still have a phase transition in the second order Landau sense of the term. You just don't have macroscopic fields in the material because something has screened them out. So you can use your phonon, transverse phonon, which I will call eta, as your order parameter. And then you need to have a coupling, which does break inversion for the fermions, otherwise, not, otherwise nothing interesting will happen, but should not create macroscopic currents. It cannot create an electric field or drive a current for your conduction electrons. That would violate Bloch's theorem, which says you can't have spontaneous currents, and then you would kind of need to fine tune your material, your system to avoid Bloch's theorem, which can be done, but is a bad idea when you're working on a completely new system. And uh, actually, several years ago, people noticed that there is such a coupling. And the idea is simple. You just couple spin and charge. You have to mix spin and charge together so that you don't create a charge current. And the natural way to do it in this case is to take your phonon, which is a vector, and dot product it with k cross sigma to create a dynamical Rashba spin orbit coupling. When your phonon condenses, your material will become Rashba split. If I think of a two-dimensional material, and for most of my talk, I will discuss only two-dimensional materials, then basically one of two things can happen. You can condense your phonon out of plane. Remember, it's a 2D material, but polarization and spin are always three-dimensional objects. So I can condense out of plane. That would create this sort of uh, Zeeman splitting for my uh, Fermi surfaces. Or I can condense in plane, which would create this well-known uh, uh, Rashba splitting of my Fermi surfaces in plane. So I have these two modes. I'll actually call them the Z mode and the T mode in a moment. <coughs> The reason why I'm talking about two dimension is just because the physics is much more transparent in two dimensions. Many of these materials are three dimensional and uh, maybe I'll briefly comment on 3D, but it's just so much easier to do this in two dimensions. So now before uh, going into the details, let me just try to give you the main message in pictures. What are the main results of this model? So here's the model in pictures. I have an optical mode, I call it eta, it's transverse. So it creates this sort of ionic deformation and it's always transverse. So the direction of propagation is perpendicular to the polarization and it's coupled in 2D to some Fermi surface, which I take to be circular. And always keep in mind that what we know very well from strongly coupled uh, boson fermion systems is that the, the best coupling is when the bosons scatter parallel to the Fermi surface. So K Fermi will scatter when Q is more or less perpendicular. And now, as I showed you before, I have these two modes. One I call the Z mode, that's when eta, the phonon crystallizes out of plane, condenses out of plane. And one which I call the T for transverse mode is when it condenses in the plane, and therefore the spin must be out of plane. And why must the spin be out of plane? Because it's K cross sigma. So K and sigma are always perpendicular to one another. And you see right now that there are an awful lot of vectors sitting on this uh, slide, and they all have to be perpendicular to one another. And there's more than three of them. And that means you can't do it. So you're going to get frustration. But this is a very interesting type of frustration. It's only dynamical geometrical frustration. And what I mean is it only occurs when you have dynamics, when you have some momentum scattering with a finite Q. Then you have four vectors that you need to put somehow perpendicular to one another, and it doesn't work. If you look at static properties, you find the geometry is perfectly satisfied. When you do Dynamics, you find this frustration, and this, as I will show you, uh, pretty interestingly and significantly impacts the critical properties of the system. Okay, in terms of a phase diagram, you know, it, it looks uh, pretty similar to what we uh, uh, know and love in terms of unconventional superconductors. You have some ordered state, the ferroelectric state, there's a second order transition, and there's also a superconducting dome in a quantum critical region. There is one additional detail. It turns out that under certain circumstances, the second order transition can become first order. We'll go into that later. But the, but the devil is in the details. So it turns out that the different modes, you can have either a non-Fermi liquid or a marginal Fermi liquid all the way down to the critical point. You don't need to fine tune anything. The system is just a marginal Fermi liquid. This first order transition is a result of something called quantum order by disorder. It's basically because you have a vector and you have additional fluctuations in the system, and you can tune it away using strain. And when you look at superconductivity, you find that basically S-wave and P-wave are essentially degenerate. 
And all of this physics, you can kind of pull out just from the coupling constant. The reason why you have S wave and P wave is just because you have both charge and spin in your interaction. The reason why you have quantum order by disorder or first order transitions is because you have a vector. So you have something that looks like Goldstone modes in the system. And the reason why you can have both a non-Fermi liquid and a marginal Fermi liquid is because of this dot product, because of trying to get too many objects to be perpendicular to one another. So now let me try to go a little bit into uh, you know, the nitty gritty details. So here's the model. It's kind of the simplest model you can write down. You take electrons, you take bosons, and you put them together. What you do is you write down uh, effective action for your air type, your boson. It, has some energy scale that's typically several MeV, say in strontium titanate. And uh, then it has a Q squared plus omega squared. I use Q naught to denote a Matsubara frequency. So I always work with three or four vectors and Q naught is just a Matsubara frequency. And you want to assume the system is more or less close to a critical point. So R naught, you know, the inverse correlation length squared is some small number. Then I couple it using this K cross sigma to my fermions. The fermions are just a Fermi circle. I didn't even write them down. And I asked, what I have to keep in mind is that this vector eta is a phonon projected onto the transverse sector. So it's always transverse to the propagation direction. I just have to keep track of this in my calculations. You will not see any of that in the rest of the talk. The, the second thing to take away from this slide is that as usual in these models, they're essentially cooked up to do so. There's basically one effective coupling constant in the system. It's the bare coupling squared times the density of states divided by some typical energy. So everything is going to scale with this one dimensionless coupling constant, which I call G here. And then what do we do? Yes. No, uh, uh, the U can be out of plane because polarization is 3D. I'll just get Q will be in plane. Okay, so think of a lattice. It can do this or it can do this. This would be lamb waves, right? In acoustic, these are optical, so they're not exactly line waves, but no problem. More questions? Okay. Um, so, so, so now I have an action. So I do what, what, what you know, what people do when they have an action. They just start generating uh, uh, responses. Let's keep to one loop. And what do we expect normally in a, you know, in one of these quantum critical materials? You're going to calculate the bosonic response and the fermionic response, maybe with some vertex corrections, which we typically drop away. And what do we expect to see? The usual result is something like this. I'm using the iron-based or pneumatic critical point as an example. First, you find that the interactions can renormalize uh, you all the way to the critical point. So you can use the interaction strength to bring you to the QCP. And then when you look at the boson dynamics, you find the bosons are overdamped. This was discussed extensively yesterday in, uh, for example, York's talk. Uh, you get the uh, lambda damping omega over Q, and therefore the system is overdamped with Z equals three. And then you go back and you feed this into the fermions, and you find that the fermions are also overdamped, and they create a non Fermi liquid at some typical energy scale, omega G. And in this case, you have omega two third behavior. This is uh, just because it's a long wavelength problem. This is also what shows up in many SYKs. Um, and then you also find, in terms of pairing, that pairing sets in always on the same energy scale that the non-Fermi liquid uh, behavior sets in. So sigma is non-Fermi liquid only on a scale of omega G or less. And at the same scale, pairing is going to set into your system and create superconductivity. And it won't be BCS because it's a polynomial of something. So what happens in our system? Well, let's go back and look uh, a little bit more careful at this question of geometric frustration. I'll run through it quickly because I already showed the picture beforehand. Here's our coupling. I've dropped a lot of indices to make things clearer. So here's the model again. And now if I ask myself about static order, I want to let eta condense. There are basically two configurations. I'm creating here two right angle triangles, two right hand trios. I can condense eta out of plane and put K and sigma like this, or I can condense eta in plane and put sigma out of plane, that would be sigma z if you want. So there are basically three geometric constraints and I can obey them all. But now when I go to dynamics, I find five geometric constraints because I have to have q more or less perpendicular to k Fermi and also q more or less perpendicular to eta. And then I see that for the z mode, I can do it because as long as the polarization is out of plane, I can play with the rest of the vectors in plane. 
But if I put my eta mode in plane and I must require Q and eta to be perpendicular, I don't have any way to make my Fermi vector uh, transverse to, to Q and to eta, and therefore I'm going to get a suppression of the interaction. So essentially, in the T mode, the in-plane mode, I have suppression of my effective coupling. In terms of the results, this is what happens. If I look at the correlation length, I find that they get renormalized differently. So of course, normally in a 2D system, you would expect the two modes, this T and Z modes, to be split. But even if we assume the lattice is somehow not important and they start together very close, they will still be differently renormalized by the electron. So only one of them will typically reach the critical point first. And this is usually the Z mode. And then you can use some tuning parameter to move away from the critical mode and go to the other one. In terms of the boson dynamics, you find that this Z mode, it basically behaves like an Ising ferromagnet. So it has over damp response, pretty standard. The T mode, because of the suppression of interaction, is actually under damped all the way to the critical point. It has omega over Q squared Landau damping. This actually means that it's a ballistic mode and it remains coherent even at strong interactions. So this, I think, is very different from what you normally expect. And then when you go and you feed this back to the fermions, you again find that the uh, Z mode is essentially a conventional non-fermi liquid with omega two thirds behavior. But the T mode, because the boson is under damped uh, and because the coupling is suppressed, essentially remains a marginal fermi liquid all the way down to the critical point. This is true even if I tune my system so that RT is not G but zero. It will, the system will still be a marginal Fermi liquid as long as there's no superconductivity in the system. So this is one very easy observable to look for. You just have to do the very hard process of creating a two-dimensional ferroelectric metal, uh, but people are working on this nowadays. Okay, what about pairing? So uh, before telling you about pairings in this system, let me give you... Can you just tell us one more time why under them? Yes, because if you if you continue this to the real axis, you'll get a real term, no damping. It will give you all, it will give you you have q squared minus omega squared minus omega squared over q squared. So omega is a sharp mode. Okay, so it's a propagating mode. Yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to see here because it's actually z equal two, which is usually diffusive, but it's not diffusive. It's under damped. Um, <clears throat> okay. What about pairing? So let me give you a two minute crash course on unconventional pairing in a spin and charge coupled systems. What do you do when you want to calculate pairing? So you put some anomalous pairing function, right? A pairing vertex. And then you calculate uh, the correction. This is basically summing up the ladder diagram by putting your favorite interaction. And all the details are going to show up if you want in the form factor of the interaction. Now, if I think, excuse me, of, Typical form factors, this a phonon would be a density interaction. So the form factor would be one. This one's always attractive. All types of superconductivity love phonons. If I put a current, or if you want a gauge field, it's been known for a very long time that these are always repulsive to pairing. And the reason is very simple. It has to go from K to minus K, and that adds a minus sign to the overall diagram. So these are always repulsive. When you put a spin term, so say a ferromagnet, then you find that it's always repulsive to singlet, but it's attractive to some triplet modes. You can go into the details, okay? It has to do with the fact that you take a spin term and you transpose it and you trace over it. But the idea is pretty simple. Obviously, ferromagnetism is bad for singlet coupling because it Zeeman splits your modes. It's also bad for some triplet coupling because it Zeeman splits your modes, but it enhances spin flip fluctuations in certain other modes and therefore it will enhance pairing in certain modes, okay? So, you know, that's how you find out whether your system is attractive or not. So now let's put K cross sigma. And what you're going to see right away is first of all, K is always repulsive to singlet and sigma is always repulsive to singlet. So their product will be minus times minus. So it's going to be attractive to singlet, okay? So the system is attractive to the singlet channel, but it's also going to be attractive in the triplet channel it just is going to be attractive in different channels than you expected. Okay, so here's a quick table. If I look at the Z mode, it's attractive to singlet, and it's also attractive to Kx sigma y minus Ky sigma x. So this is some nodeless, uh, 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 you know, phase changing mode. And the T mode is attractive to singlet and to uh, uh, to a doublet uh, Kx Ky 
a spin polarized triplet mode. That means that in this mode, you would see chiral, you could see chiral superconductivity, pneumatic superconductivity. And when you calculate TC, you find that the leading order, which means the splitting between them is very small. This is something that Jorg also talked about briefly yesterday. To leading order, these two terms are degenerate. Okay, so in these materials, you really expect to see strong singlet and triplet uh, uh, pairing in two dimensions. In terms of the pairing temperature, so for the Z-mode, because as I showed you, it's a conventional non-Fermi liquid, you get the usual non-Fermi liquid TC, which is a polynomial. This is the same G-squared that Jorg showed yesterday. And uh, for the T-mode, because of its weird frustration, you find actually enhanced BCS. It's one over the square root of the coupling constant. And it's actually in a, in a very narrow region around the critical point. So it will be strong, but it will be narrow. And you have to probably tune your system pretty carefully to get to it. Um, and then you could get chiral superconductivity. Yes. No, this square, okay, very good question. This square root, I saw that uh, Damson was nodding and that's because in three-dimensional quantum criticality, it's well known that this is what happens. This is the same form as what happens in 3D quantum criticality. The physical mechanism is completely different. It has something to do with an enhanced, because the boson is under damped, its pairing fluctuations are strongly enhanced. On the other hand, the Cooper logarithm is completely gone because of the suppression of coupling. And what you get is essentially a log from the bosons. This is you know, something pretty strange, okay? It's very non-VCS. Just has a form that looks a little bit like VCS. Okay, so that's almost the entire picture, but not quite. And uh, let me give you a couple of slides about quantum order by disorder. This is a problem which was studied extensively in ferromagnets. It was actually the original reason why we started looking at this problem, because we were wondering whether ferroelectricity has quantum order by disorder. The idea is as follows. You can look at it here in this picture. Supposing I have a vector mode that condenses, then I know that there's always a Goldstone mode. For example, uh, uh, if it was a ferromagnet and I split my Fermi surfaces, I would have soft phase modes that are between the two Fermi surfaces. And a system will typically, this costs energy, fluctuational energy, and the system will like to remove this fluctuational energy, and it can do it either by preempting the second order transition via first order transition, or by going into a spiral, a finite density wave uh, uh, state, okay, with some finite momentum. And uh, basically what happens is that if you look here, if I split my Fermi surfaces with some finite order, which I'll call delta, then there's a minimum momentum transfer for fluctuations. I have to have some minimum momentum transfer to take my chiral uh, uh, fermion and move it to the other chirality in my Rashba split surfaces. This gives an IR cutoff to fluctuations. And basically what it does is it, it provides this cutoff, which generates non-analytic terms in the free energy. So you have to calculate all sorts of diagrams like this. It's somewhat more involved than was done in uh, ferromagnetism for technical reasons, but you can do it. And really what you find essentially is that it generates a negative non-analytic cubic term in the free energy, which of course tells you the system will prefer to condense into a first order by a first order transition. Um, it also turns out, and this is probably a numerical art of, you know, just has to do with numbers, but it's a big number, that the Z-mode uh, is much, much more unstable to the first order transition than, uh, than the T-mode. So, you know, after cranking all of this out, you can end up with kind of these sort of schematic phase diagrams. Uh, in terms of the Z-mode, this is the picture I showed you beforehand. You have a second order transition, which eventually goes through a bicritical point into a first order transition. And when you go and just compare temperatures for superconductivity and this first order transition, you find that, uh, that it probably, probably rises above the first order transition. But, and this is a bit of a technical detail, so I'll just say it as kind of an advertisement, the mode that causes quantum order by disorder is actually the T mode. When you have Z condensing, it's the T mode. When you have T condensing, it's the Z mode. This again has to do with this weird transverse coupling. And that means that if you can control how split the two modes are, you can control the extent of this first order transition. So you can create a switch. You can have it first order, second order, first order, second order, superconducting, non-superconducting, and so forth. The T mode looks more or less the same, except probably the superconducting phase is buried under the first order transition. 
but you can get rid of the first order transition anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so, so far I've showed you some maybe interesting, maybe strange properties. And now let me tell you why I think this is also important. And the reason is because we are doping a ferroelectric and ferroelectrics are very useful from applications point of view. The reason is right here. This is actually, I think, a calculation of a phase diagram for strontium titanate as a function of strain. And what you see basically is that at zero strain, it's essentially a paraelectric, except for very small range, which is experimentally incorrect. Experimentally, it's a paraelectric down to zero temperature. And then you play with the strain and it becomes ferroelectric. And the reason is symmetry. A eta is an odd under inversion mode, so it can only couple quadratically to strain of some form. So it does, so strain does not act as a field, it acts as a mass enhancement or reduction. And this means that you can play with the mass by playing with the strain. Just think of a simple problem, allow for two types of strain, volume preserving and volume non-preserving. So if you want pressure and a, a, some D wave, and you'll get a phase diagram, which will result from the fact that the Z and the T modes will just shift differently as you play with different types of strain. So here's a schematic phase diagram. It's quite busy. But it basically shows you that through strain, you can reach basically all of the phases that I talked about. And to make things a little bit simpler, I just plotted what uniaxial strain would look like. You know, it's just a line through this phase diagram. You see that it basically goes to the superconducting, the first order and the second order phase transitions. And this tells you that with appropriate engineering, you can really create a quantum switch from these materials. All right. I'm, I'm going to skip most of 3D because uh, you know I don't think I have much time. I have a total of what, 15 minutes, 10 minutes? I don't remember when we started. Yeah, uh, so you've been going for half an hour. Okay. So you have another 15. Okay. So let me then very, very briefly tell you what happens in 3D. The short answer is the same. It's just more complicated because you have more dimensions to work with. You know, if you have some vector K, then in transverse to K, there are there's a whole plane, so you have, to, you have to span the plane and play with all your vector products. So this is really technical. Uh, the end result is more or less what you would expect with one surprise. The system is a marginal Fermi liquid, both without strain and with strain. This is well known from three-dimensional systems. Three-dimensional systems are always marginal Fermi liquids, even at the critical point because of dimensionality. If you ask whether the system undergoes quantum order by disorder, the answer is yes, without strain. But then you put strain and you can just get rid of it and make the system second order, similar to the uh, two-dimensional system. In pairing, it turns out that in the absence of strain, only singlet is attractive. And, and triplet is actually marginal, neither attractive nor repulsive to leading order, which means that you know non-universal subleading terms are what's going to determine whether it's attractive. We expect that it's attractive, but much more weakly than the singlet at the critical point. But then you put strain, and you basically make them almost degenerate again. And this is quite surprising, quite interesting, because I think a lot of recent experiments showing signs of unconventional superconductivity in these materials occur in strained, uh, in strained samples. So we haven't done careful study of this, but at least it's a suggestion. All right, so now I've, I think I've, I've spent a lot of time kind of showing some theoretical uh, properties. And, and if you fell asleep halfway through, Maybe now is a time to wake up because I'll try to show what I think is a beautiful experiment, which I did not believe for a very long time, but I sort of believe now. Um, so I want to talk about uh, strontium titanate. Strontium titanate is the poster child of a quantum ferroelectric metal. It was realized that it was an unconventional superconductor back in the 60s. Until today, people don't really know why it happens. It has very low density superconductivity. You can basically tune the carrier density from 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 20 carriers per centimeter cubed, and it will show superconductivity in almost all of these uh, uh, regions. There is a good deal of indirect evidence for pairing as a result of the ferroelectric modes. But if you go and do a calculation, uh, you find that you just do DFT and you find out what the coupling of K cross sigma is, you find that it's large, but the Fermi surface is so small in these materials at low density that it's probably not enough to explain superconductivity. What I'm showing you here is two kind of phase diagrams. This is a, a phase diagram as a function of carrier density. So in some insulating materials, you, in some doped, sorry, materials, you can have the, fa the ferroelectric mode go down and then superconductivity rises out and there's possibly coexistence. Maybe more interesting is this three-dimensional 
uh, uh, phase diagram, which shows that you can dope independently, say with calcium, to go to the critical point for ferroelectricity, and then dope, say with oxygen vacancies, to change your carrier density and really control both the distance from the critical point and superconductivity in this system. What uh, the group of uh, Martin Greven did, this was the, her, his uh, uh, grad student, Sajna Hamid, and uh, really pioneered by his postdoc, uh, Damian Petsch, who has just opened his own group back in Croatia, was to take the strontium titanate uh, and squeeze it to death. And I really mean to death. They deformed it uh, up to 10, it, the strontium titanate has beautiful elastic properties. You can deform it up to 10% without, uh, without it cracking. And they took it and they squashed it between one and 6%. They plastically deformed it, something completely irreversible. And of course, this should totally kill superconductivity, right? Huge disorder, dislocations, inhomogeneities. And then of course, TC jumps by a factor of two. Uh, so this is the pristine phase diagram uh, uh, dome, superconducting dome of STO. And here are the stars that they get by deforming various percentages. So they managed to go up to a factor of two. And the superconductivity is extremely inhomogene inhomogeneous. Basically, it really depends on whether you measure perpendicular or parallel to the direction of, to the plane of the strain. Uh, this is actually, this, this can be well understood classically. It's not surprising at all. Um, but something very strange is happening in this system. And uh, not only that, but if you go and you measure resistivity, you find the resistivity, again, is anisotropic and begins to drop quite strongly already at tens of Kelvin. And it drops by orders of magnitude which is at least a hint that you might have superconducting fluctuations or small fluctuating, small superconducting regions already at tens of Kelvin, which is you know, just insane. TC here is a fraction of a Kelvin. And when you do uh, hall measurements, you find that the hall density is just completely flat. So this is not a carrier density uh, uh, effect. Strangely enough, you know, hall density just doesn't change. What does happen? If you look at neutrons, you find this kind of very lovely uh, figure where you see that all the Bragg peaks have kind of been smeared. These are called asterisms, and they are uh, typically understood to be a sign of dislocations in the system. What's happening is that your system has deformed into domains which are slightly tilted to one another, and this kind of causes the Bragg peaks to smear out into lines. Here is a Fourier transform of the Bragg diffraction pattern, and here is just a numerical uh, simulation of just by putting a dislocation wall that creates a series of these domains. And you see that there's really a very good agreement in terms of the typical scales and the, the overall behavior. So we believe that that's exactly what's happening in the system. If you want a toy picture, you have your system and it's sort of deforming into this series of tilted domains to one another, which creates a series of dislocation walls running through the, sim this, the system. These are Berger's vectors for people who are familiar with uh, elastic uh, model. But this is important because as I showed you before, strain has a really strong impact on ferroelectric uh, uh, materials. And basically what happens is that if you put a dislocation, there's very strong strain near the dislocation and it decays algebraically away. And this tells you, this is actually a calculation of the effect of a single dislocation on the ferroelectric mass as a function of distance. And what you see here is that very, very near the dislocation, there's a huge, a, a change of the mass and the system must have ferroelectric order there. And this will be very strong. It will probably compete with superconductivity, but the strain decays algebraically. And so very far away, there's no strain and nothing interesting happens, which tells you that there must be a region where the mass has to go. The inverse mass must go to zero. It's essentially a topological uh, requirement. So there's going to be a circle around the dislocation where fluctuations will be critically enhanced and where you expect superconductivity to be very strong. If you add a wall, this is Landau and Lifshitz problem, you just get screening. So instead of long range strain, you get exponentially decaying strain with two kinds of sheets running parallel to the dislocation wall where superconductivity should be strongly uh, enhanced. So um, we did this and uh, I didn't believe it even though I wrote the theory and we sent it into nature materials and surprise, surprise, they didn't believe us either. And I was ready to give up, but the experimentalists said, no, we are going to prove that this is what's happening in the system. And they sent it for Raman to do Raman scattering. Why Raman scattering? Because Raman scattering is only coupling to polar modes in the presence of broken inversion symmetry. They wanted to prove that the dislocations were in fact inducing local ferroelectricity, which is so obvious that you don't need to prove it, but the referees didn't believe it. 
Um, so they did it. And this is what you get. This is an insulating squashed sample. And what you see here is an optical TO mode, which only exists in the deformed sample. So yay, definitely broken inversion symmetry in the system. But when I saw this, I got super excited because what you see here is a much bigger feature, some very low energy, huge spectral weight. And for anybody who works in unconventional superconductivity, this is a real trigger because this was shown in iron-based superconductors to be exactly what appears in Raman when you approach a critical point. When you approach an emetic critical point, you get this huge enhancement of spectral fluctuations, which becomes stronger and softer. And this is also true in the doped systems. You see the same huge enhancement of spectral weight. It looks a little bit different because there's some subtraction in the background, and the mode becomes soft. It perfectly obeys Curie Weiss behavior or very well obeys Curie Weiss behavior. So, actually, what happened is that kind of by chance, I think for the first time, these guys image directly the inelastic quantum critical fluctuations of the polar mode. If you have order and you have quantum critical fluctuations, then by the topological argument I gave beforehand, you must have regions of enhanced superconductivity. Uh, I am basically out of time, right? Or... I have five minutes. I speak too fast. Okay. Um, so so when, when I saw this, let me say, when I saw this, I finally was going to believe that maybe maybe something is happening. It's important in terms of what I was saying beforehand, because it tells you that you can take a material, you can dope it into a metallic state, and it does not kill ferroelectricity, and it also does not kill the ferroelectric fluctuations. And that means that just find any coupling, I don't care which, take my K cross sigma, take some other coupling, I don't care what, you are going to get strong electron phonon coupling in the system, strongly enhanced by critical fluctuations. And so everything I said will at least qualitatively be correct. All right, in one minute, let me tell you something about the Dirac material. So you can do the same game for the Dirac material. Uh, take a Dirac mode cone and couple it to basically this K cross sigma. Now you have to use gamma matrices. But what happens is that upon creating order, your cone splits into two vial, uh, vial cones. And uh, then the question is, you know, what happens at this kind of transition? This can occur, for example, in uh, lead telluride and possibly in molybdite telluride, which is a, excuse me, a type two vial uh, material. Um, so again, you try to calculate various things. And when you calculate the bosonic response, you find something which is quite surprising. Already at one loop order, this is definitely something that I do not know happening in typical Fermi liquid systems. It usually does not happen. Uh, already at one loop order, you find a strong negative logarithmic correction, which means the system is always unstable to uh, creating a finite momentum, a ferroelectric density wave. Um, and then uh, this already happens, like I said, at one loop. It only happens for ferroelectric coupling, and it only happens in three dimensions. In two dimensions, the sign is wrong, if I remember correctly. Um, and what this means is that you have some, you know, some renormalized critical point to a finite ferroelectric density wave order. And then you go and you calculate pairing and you find something rather strange. Normally, when you have a, a electron hole order, say like ferroelectricity and superconductivity, they fight. They're always competing because they're kind of fighting for phase space on the Fermi surface. But it turns out that when you calculate for this specific case, what happens to the uh, bosonic FDW propagator as you increase delta, it becomes softer. The system wants delta superconductivity helps the system become more and more uh, ferroelectric. And the reason basically is because there's at the charge neutrality point, by creating ferroelectric order, you're kind of creating a larger phase space for uh, pairing fluctuations. And the converse is also true. The FDW instability drives pairing. So they like one another and they drive one another together. And when you go and you calculate, for example, the free energy of the system, you find that the free energy is basically unstable to uh, both ferroelectricity and superconductivity, which tells you that the system should somehow undergo a first order phase transition into a coexisting ferroelectric and superconducting state. This is all occurring precisely at the charge neutrality point. Okay, this is kind of a phase diagram showing a hysteresis loop that you would get. You would start, say, at low temperature, at some point, you would hit superconductivity and, and ferroelectricity, then you could go out and you wouldn't lose ferroelectricity and superconductivity until you reach some other uh, point in the system. Um, 
here are some open questions that I think are quite interesting. For example, what happens to this in instability upon doping? Like I told you, this one loop thing is very strange. Okay, and it definitely goes away upon doping. Um, what about electric skirmions? Here I have some spin charge material. Clearly, I should be able to create electric vortices. This is a problem we're working on. The question of transport in these materials is a huge open question that Mitya was talking about a little bit yesterday. And uh, finally, I think another important question is what exactly is the structure near dislocations? Could there be magnetism there? You know, what is the spin texture? And so on and so forth. So let me flash my summary slide, and I think I will end here. All right, so there is one question in the chat from uh, Andre Chubuko. Um, does uh, this permian self energy, I, I guess this re re relates to the um, uh, part um, about the two dimensional criticality, um, does um, this permian self energy going as omega log omega appear only when the mass of a T boson is tuned to zero? So this is the first question. No, no, it appears for, uh, it appears, ah. So there's a crossover. It, uh, it, it's purely omega log omega at the critical point. And then if you put some finite uh, distance, then there'll be a crossover scale at the lowest frequencies. It's good for me liquid and at higher frequencies, omega log omega. And to my follow up to this. So you have this sigma plus k. Yeah. So do you assume that the material has spin orbit coupling to start? With no. It's, it's, if it has spin orbit, then it's, uh, it, it maintains inversion symmetry. So. Actually, to get k cross sigma, you need to have microscopically probably some spin orbit coupling, but you will always have two degenerate states. So call sigma just two orbitals, and you get the same physics. Was, was that uh, clear? So you, you need to have two orbitals. You can call them spin. You can call them something else. For example, in strontium titanate, there is spin orbit coupling, and the lowest two bands are J3 half, and they happen to be MZ minus uh, 3 half and plus 3 half. So it's basically a spin degree of freedom. Time reversal is maintained. You hear it's explicitly maintained. Right? But, but, but um, so, so it's, um, spin orbit is present in the microscopic chemical. Yes. You don't spontaneously break the spin rotation symmetry. That's, that's right. Important. That's right. Okay. So you, that's why the spin should be thought of as some effective spin. That, that's correct. It just so happens that in the most interesting material, it really is spin. And then there is another question from Andre, which is um, um, on superconductivity. You said that Cooper law is suppressed. How do you get this exponential of minus one to the square root G? Normally, this holds when you get both a Cooper log and an extra log from a boson, which results in a G log squared in the Cooper channel. Yeah, so what you get is something completely different you get uh, that the boson goes as one over square root of something that gives a log. So it's one over square root of G, that's from lambda damping, and then it's one over omega, which gives you a log. So it's nothing to do with the log squared in 3D. It's really just from the boson. Yeah, it's, it's really non-trivial and it took me a while to believe it. I, maybe I don't believe it now, but at least I'm claiming I do. About the Electric skirmions, what is the other pa 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 parameter? Again, again? About the skirmions, could you explain about the skirmions? What, yeah, so what, we what, haven't what done is it. the other parameter? Yeah, this eta. So this eta would go around in circles. And the K cross sigma, the Rashba spin orbit would kind of do something like this. So something so which would be electric the, spin. The, there is a, a rotational invariance for Eta, right? Yes. Yes. So you break it and then you play. And what is the dimensionality of your? Oh, well, I didn't do it, so I can't say. <laughs> I have I have the critical theory for both two and three systems. Ah, in, in Dirac, yes, it's three D. In Dirac, it's three D, and two D, it's not. All this does go, more or less goes away. So the, this is a real skirmions, not not not. Not baby skirmions, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. So I can tell you what we have people looking at. Um, uh, you just take that. We were looking at hexagonal lattices in the hope that in uh, presence of a lattice symmetry, you break down the rotational symmetry just to a discrete symmetry. And then you can look for triple Q states. And then, then you have a skirmion without mm -hmm. going into all this Thank other you. stuff.
in the case of the pneumatic system, there's the sad truth that some of the beautiful critical physics that we love is being suppressed when you include acoustic phonons. Correct. Um, what's the situation for your case? Because you also have a structural degree of freedom. If you were to include acoustic phonons, would it give you uh, a non-analytic long range interaction of your bosons, which then would spoil all the beauty? So I don't think it would spoil the beauty in two, in two ways. First of all, to some extent, I did include the acoustic phonons. I just didn't include the fluctuations because I put a strain tensor explicitly in my system. I could add Q dependence to it. Well, that's not enough. I said, I could now add Q and omega dependence. And I know what would happen. I would get Larkin picking instabilities, mm -hmm. uh, but these are typically very low temperature. So if my electronic scale is high enough, I can hope that they're not there. I don't know of any measurement of Larkin picking instabilities in these materials. I definitely agree that if your system has a Larkin picking instability, then you know, it underwent a first order purely bosonic transition. So what are you even talking about? Um, so when there is a uh, impurity in the system, like when in the polar ionic case, um, the impurity in the system creates an electric field inside in case of polar. So what will happen in this case? Any comment on that? Yeah, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, but uh, the, the point is you have conduction electrons. So presumably on a Thomas Fermi screening scale, that should be screened out. Um, beyond that, we really don't know the answer. It's a definitely a good question, including the question. I think even more interesting is what happens when you have two of them. Do they create some kind of FFLO like uh, interaction? We, we don't know that. Yeah, the first question probably you've answered, but uh, how do you experimentally distinguish between your Z modes and the T modes? Oh, yeah. and the second I did mode? not say it. It's very hard. The real problem in this system is that measuring anything is very hard because it's a ferroelectric that's being screened. Okay. And actually, one of the motivations here is that I would say that one of the only ways that you can uh, really accurately measure things is by looking at collective modes, because those will just show up in spectral space. It turns out that because one is overdamped and one is underdamped, they have very different collective modes. I didn't go into the details. Um, um, uh, Andre and I have another paper on a different system, which basically kind of shows what are these possible modes. Um, and they're, these are probably the best ways. Another way is to look at optical conductivity that's been calculated by uh, Premi Chandra's group, by Abhishek Kumar and others. And uh, finally, one fantastic way to do it by mistake is to squeeze the material very hard because then you locally break polar symmetry while leaving the bulk inversion symmetric. And that's how you can measure things directly, as I showed you. Well, second question is that in the 3D case, does the dynamical frustration still exist? Because no, it's it, okay, less. So this very strong dynamical frustration is a 2D thing. Yeah. It's there in 3D, but it's a lot less clear to see where it comes up. And this is why 90% of the talk was in, was in 2D. Okay. Thank you.